But if children are able to grow up in a kind of an untouched environment, they're pretty pure little people. <laughs> Listen to news about schools in West, especially in the United States of America. Uh, we tend to hear news a lot about gun violence. Yeah, I, I think that I had a few teachers who taught me things without actually trying. It's not for me to tell Nepal how to run schools. The way to go is to get young people to teach, to understand teaching is a really important function. If the government has not recognized what you've done, uh, I'd like to say that the two of us who are running the podcast, do you have a sense of appreciation that you've come all the way from Canada? It is quite fascinating to know that there are people from outside Nepal who come to our country and spend more than a decade, more than two or three decades to give their lives to causes such as education, such as health, uh, and other basic necessities. This is a point of great fascination at a time in our country where more and more people are flocking out of it. Uh, what, what do you see about this demographic change in our country that's happened in the last 30 or 40 years? I, I, it was pointed out to me about 20 years ago by an anthropologist right. who was working up in High Gorka. And at that time, I really didn't know much. But he said some villages are just emptying out of all the able-bodied ones. The mums with small children and the elderly ones are staying. So for this, uh, it makes me sad because um, Nepal is a wonderful country and people are wonderful. It makes me really sad to see it. And we do our best to try to encourage kids to stay. I know that they... We are in a school. I, I know that, our, uh, that many kids go overseas because they want to help their parents who are getting elderly. So I understand it, but when I look ahead, I see um, culture getting lost. Because if only the very elderly and young mothers with small children are there, who's there to take the transmission of the knowledge? And there's so much rich knowledge in Nepal of culture, not just in the mountains. Yeah, I work in the mo with mountain kids, but. It's true of the whole country. Yeah, that makes me feel sad. So how was the seed planted about the idea that you want to work with the Himalayan children? It happened by accident, actually. Uh, I'm, I met our founder, who's a very great lama, uh -huh. in Canada, and he left a very deep impression on me. And so when I moved to Japan to, to work, uh, I would commute to Nepal. It's only a day's journey, where I was going back to my home island in Canada, two full days. Uh, and I, when I would come here, I would visit the school, just out of curiosity. I am a teacher. And um, one thing led to another. And I, I would come every year for Rinpoche's teachings. And then one year, suddenly his schedule for the upcoming year changed. And I thought, oh, well, I can continue to live in, in Japan, which I loved, or I can go to Nepal to be listening to those teachings. And it, there wasn't a choice. I just jumped. Okay. Uh, any stark differences between Nepal and Japan? I mean, the language is different. The country is an island. This is a landlocked one. There. True. There, um, the Japanese say about their own culture, it's a sticky culture, like natto. Natto is uh, fermented soybeans. And um, I think Nepal's kind of a sticky culture too. It, it, it's warm. It's close. I, I can give you an example showing from the other side. One of the first, not the first, but one of the first of our kids who went overseas for a scholarship. I took him to a school, a beautiful school in North Vancouver, right below the ski slopes, absolutely beautiful school. And so I, let, I met his host parents and they were wonderful. School was fabulous and 
I said, okay, so Linda, now I'm going to fundraise, but I'll be back in three weeks or a month, I forget which, and I'll meet you here. And it was a, a lobby of the school, like the, the reception area. One whole two floors was glass looking up the ski slopes. You could see bears and stuff. So off I went, and I came back and met him as planned and said, so how is it? He said, well, it's quite nice and blah, 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 blah. And then he said, but it's not like Nepal. And I said, oh, how so? Because I felt something not. And he said, well, you know, when I'm sitting here, Canadian kids will come zooming by and they say, how I end up? And then they zoom off. And being Canadian, I said, well, yeah, so? He said, well, the thing is, if it's Nepal, if it's SMD, they'll know that maybe I'm a little bit lonely and they'll sit down and talk with me. And I thought, aha, this is the sticky culture versus the very independent Western. Yeah. And I, I thought that tagged it really well. So uh, when you started the school in Bodo, uh, it might have been about two or three decades ago. Uh, yeah, our Lama broke ground here in 1985 mm -hmm. and opened the school in 1987. And I didn't come over the horizon until 97. Mm -hmm. So school was already here. It's been operating since 87. And I think back to, wow, Trangu Rinpoche was educated in Tibet, in the monastery, the really centuries-old style of education, and he was light years ahead of me, and I think I'm progressive. <laughs> and I think that Bode itself has undergone a lot of transformation. I mean, we see old photographs of the monastery lodged, lodged uh, in the center of great fields of rice, things like that. So how, how, how has Bode changed in your eyes? I first started visiting while I lived in Japan, and that would have been in the late 80s. And uh, I remember a lot of rice paddies. And at night, there were packs of dogs, which could be dangerous. And so the only dangerous thing at that time were dogs and water buffalo. I knew two people who got attacked by water buffalo. <laughs> yeah, they were carrying plastic bags, and the wind was shuffling the paper, making a noise. And I think that drew the attention of the buff. So, yeah, mostly it was all green. I, I must have come during monsoon. So is, is there a pang of nostalgia sometimes, wishing back to the earlier days? Oh, we have electricity now. <laughs> <laughs> and and that, that, that's a big benefit in a school, yeah? We can ring the bells, for example, yeah. And, and when me and my friend were coming to uh, meet you today, for this episode, we couldn't quite locate the school. Uh, and then when I talked to the security guard here, he told me that uh, the time of the Maoist insurgency was extremely tough on this school. And this is a sentiment shared by a lot of other schools as well. So how, how, how did you take a look at uh, the Maoist insurgency period in our country? The thing is, after the war ended, and the Maobadi came in out of the jungles, uh, whoever came to extort money, mostly it was about money. I think it was entirely about money, actually. There were other verbalizations, but I think it was about money. And I couldn't differentiate between Maobadi and Cowbadi. So uh, they could have been just carpetbaggers, I don't know. It, we had a bit of a rough time right after the war because a lot of, sh we, we got sh shaken down quite a bit. As far as I know, we, ne we didn't pay anything. And um, one time I was out on the road using foul language <laughs> on some guys who were, but they told me, they, we just want to come in because we heard your staff is not happy. We want to help you. Um, but these are the same guys that had been threatening to bring iron bars in to break our gate guards' legs. So I swore at them. I said, what do you think? I have two brain cells and two don't work. F right off. I just censored my speech here. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I wondered how beautiful or how rough it might have sounded in the Nepalese language. Oh, I said it in English because I was so frustrated. Actually, when I they they'd been coming to our school um, for a few weeks just before dismissal time, about twenty minutes before dismissal, and then they would be putting pressure on outside. And that day, this is about the third week. That day it was the. I got eight calls from the school. I'm connected to the school by intercom. Different parts of the school, everybody freaking out. And I just lost my temper. So I went out on into the road, and there were a bunch of guys out there in front of our small gate. And um, I, on my way there, I was so angry with them because I knew they were doing this to stop kids from going home. Our nuns going across the valley to Sita Pila and then school bus and all our day kids and our monks going to the monastery and our teachers. Our teachers were scared. So I thought on my way there, I thought, oh, I'll just talk to them in Japanese. I'll mess with their heads. <laughs> and so when I came out there, I was talking Japanese for a while. And the one guy who had his motorcycle visor down the whole time, I could just see here. He, after a few minutes, he said, I know you're not Japanese. I know you're Canadian. I've been in your office. So then I said, okay, so what do you want? And that's when they said, we just want to talk to your staff because we they're, here they're unhappy. Yeah, and that's when I said, you think I've got two brain cells and one of them doesn't work. Now let's talk about the comparison of how the school ran before the revolution or the war or the insurgency, whichever way you'd want to put it. I think war would be an apt term to describe the, the civil war, as they call it. Um, so has the functionings of school been better in terms of the facilities that government provides? or The government doesn't provide anything. Everything in the school, everything you see, is provided by sponsors. The clothing I'm wearing, this sweater was given to me by a friend in Canada. Yeah, nothing, we get nothing from the government. And it, I was quite heartbroken to hear you explain that even when you tried to build a library here, it was really tough to get the books from outside. The government really needs revenue. Um, perhaps if there were fewer overseas trips, they'd have, they'd have a little more money to run the country. <laughs> uh, but books that are published outside Nepal are taxed at 10%. And uh, that puts a book, like a paperback book that costs $35 in the States. We can't pay for that. We don't have, we don't have that much money. Every kid in this kid goes to this school goes to Every kid in this school goes to school for free, and the money comes all from overseas. Yeah, there's one Nepali company. The mother company is Jap uh, not Japanese, is American. Little boost for Flextex. The company is Flextex. The mother company is in the U.S. There's Flextex Nepal. Um, they sponsor children here, but in my 26 years. I can count the number of Nepali sponsors in this school on one hand. And from the government, zero. Mm -hmm. so have you ever been to the government in order to talk about the possibility of... That's a very good point. Uh, anytime I show my face, it costs money. Um, I think it would be much more feasible, very much more doable for, for example, our principal who is, uh, he was the vice chairman of the Lumbini Development Fund. Mm -hmm. He is, uh, as we say in English, a mover and a shaker. He knows everybody. He's somebody who could move things further, faster with the government. Um, in my case, I think being a Canadian is not helpful. Mm -hmm. Being in a female body is also not helpful. Having gray hair is also probably not very helpful. Might have been even less helpful when I was young. <laughs> uh, um, I, I think it's best left to Nepalese to do this, to, to bring change inside the country. And our principal's moving on that really strongly. Um, he wants to see 
children educated here to be able to go into the civil service, to write the Lok Sewa, and um, to, to bring change from within. I can think of uh, many reasons why that would be very good. One being, we've had more than 80 of our kids go for scholarships overseas, and I handle all the paperwork, all the government stuff. And the obstacles that Himalayan children hit uh, put me in mind of the 1950s and the fight for the vote in the U.S. for black people. The amount of prejudice is uh, gobsmacking. And I think that more younger people get into social service and more people who are uh, different types of people, for example, Chana Jatis, Dalits, whoever, that, that more diversity would help the country enormously. Because people in the government will understand what are the problems that the service seekers are coming for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, change through education. <laughs> well, changing education is quite a difficult task. I mean, uh, do you see that the way we could run schools in our country differently? Maybe, I mean... Well, oh, it's not for me to tell Nepal how to run schools. I think it's not my place to do that. It is my place to, to give this school direction. Our founder gave me that task. Uh, and I, I see quite amazing things happening in education in Nepal, unfortunately not in the public school system. And, um, but I will single out a few. For example, Rato Bangala, mm -hmm. excellent school, mm -hmm. child-centered education. I have worked a lot with Shanta Dixit over the years and have great respect for Rato Bangala. Ulins is another school that I have a lot of respect for. Medan Namachane, the head of school there, excellent educator. And what uh, Shisir Kanal uh, has been doing with um, Teach for Nepal, mm -hmm. there is the way to go. And, and the way to go is to get young people to teach, to understand teaching is a really important function in a culture. Mm -hmm. It's really, really important. Children are the future. So... Uh, you asked me a while back, has our school changed since the war? We had a lot of pressure after the war. And I write, I write the management plan. I wrote the original management plan. I write all the job descriptions and the contracts and all of that. And for some years, a lot of the management plan and the contracts were actually filling holes in the leaking dike uh, to protect us and also to protect our staff. So in the beginning, when we first were giving contracts to our staff, they'd never had contracts before, both the support staff and the um, teaching staff. And uh, the support staff were quite open-hearted about it, but some of the teachers were what are you guys doing? Are you trying to cheat us? Are you trying to dominate us? There was a lot of fear in their responses. And I explained to them over and over again, a contact is a promise on your side and on our side. Your side, you will do the job we are giving you. Here's the job description. Our side, these are the conditions we will live up to according to your contract and your job description. And we both agree. And it took a long time to overcome, the, I think it was fear of exploitation. Yeah. Um, we, we were, I think we might have been the first school in the country to give medical support to our staff. Uh, we do all sorts of things that before the law was changed, when the Maoists came into the government and started to change laws, a lot of the things we'd already done and been doing for years. The one thing we couldn't do, we couldn't up our salaries so vastly, so quickly. We just, we didn't have it. 
all our money comes from wherever we can source it in 20... I've been saying 26, 27 countries. Yesterday I counted, and I think it's 25. 25. Right now, yeah. So, And it means a heck of a lot of work. I communicate with all those sponsors. It's a, really a lot of work, except the U.S. We have a woman in the U.S. who runs our nonprofit foundation there. She does a lot of the fundraising for the U.S. too. But, uh, yeah, when the government suddenly raised salaries, it, it had to happen. Teachers need to be paid more. But I think at the same time, what the government might have looked at was what's happening in the schools and, and helping the teachers, the helping them to upgrade. So for i give you another example. Many years ago, after I became the director here, our Trangu Rinpoche, our founder, called us, called me down to the monastery. His attendant called and said, Rinpoche wants to see you. So I ran down there thinking, oh, what did I do wrong? <laughs> like going to the principal's office. And I got there and um, he said, can you call a staff meeting? I said, yes. And he said, I want you to call a staff meeting and I want you to tell everyone there's to be no beating in my school. And then he, he enumerated all his reasons. It was long before the law was imposed in the country. So I came back to school, called a staff meeting, and one of our teachers, bless his heart, he's actually, he's, he's, uh, he wears robes, he looks like a monk, but if you know how to read the robes, the bottom robe, the shamtab, is folded differently. So it folded like this at the back. But if it's a monk, it's folded this way in the front and this way in the back. I might have it backwards. But anyway, we call that kind of a person a nagpa. So he's a lifetime practitioner. He it, it, it should be wearing robes, especially when he's teaching. Spent 11 years in higher Buddhist uh, philosophical studies in Rumtek in India, in Sikkim. He jumped up. When I said Rinpoche wants beating to be taken completely out of his school, he jumped up and he said, if we can't beat, how can we teach? And uh, I was so shocked because we don't have beating in Canada. But I thought about it, and I know this man. He's a very good man, very good man, always joking. But if you listen, his jokes are always teaching what Lord Buddha taught. And he's the same to everybody. There's no like or dislike. He's like the sun. He just shines equally. And that came out of innocence. Mm -hmm. And then I analyzed it. I always analyze. And I thought, well, he's come through a system where he was beaten. Mm -hmm. And then he went on into higher education. And probably there was beating there. I don't know. And that's all he knows. And if we take beating away, then naturally teachers are scared. What's going to happen? There's going to be chaos in my class. And how are kids going to learn? And then after I figured all that out, I thought, oh, okay, so what we've got to do is we've got to educate our teachers. We've got to give them tools. Mm -hmm. So then we started doing um, teacher in-service education. I started by teaching some developmental psychology. We, Canada, you have to have that to teach. And after a while, I figured out, oh, yeah, I could get somebody who could do it a lot better than I can because they could do it in Nepali. And we have a friend, uh, a prominent psychiatrist in Nepal, who is wonderful. His name is Pushpa P. Sharma. And I, uh, we've worked with him for 23 years, maybe. I asked Dr. Sharma to come, could you come and teach developmental psychology so, so teachers can understand how children mature cognitively, socially, emotionally. So that's where we started with teacher training. And then when every year when I'm asking teachers, what do you want? What can we give you? What can help you? Nowadays, what they ask for is um, teaching technique. Yeah, how to do this, how to present that. And that's what we try to give them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Our teachers are terrific. They're wonderful. <laughs> our results day, uh, we just posted a film on our Facebook page. I didn't. One of my assistants posted it. He made the film. And he, through the whole film, you see smiles everywhere on teachers' faces, parents' faces, kids' faces. My motto, happy children learn. This is a happy school. Our teachers rock. So I'm aware of support staff. Yeah, they, they do. Uh, I also wanted to know if you, since there's a lot of uh, people, sponsors to talk to, who probable sponsors as well, do you also get to talk to the parents of the children? on a regular occasion because regularly because most of our parents are really high altitude it's very far away and the ones who come up and down it's more often the fathers not always we've lost in the years i've been here we've lost four fathers to falls we haven't lost any children we lost one mum to a fall two years ago so it's hazardous for them to come and go uh, when they come in the beginning of the year, I meet the parents then. And we talk to the parents. We explain why our founder started this school. When we say, you guys are Highland people. 200, 400 years ago, actually, you came from Tibet. Now you're Sherpa, you're Tamang, you're Lama, you're uh, Guru, whatever. But your roots are in Tibet. And your languages are close to Tibetan. And your culture is close to Tibetan. And not only that, you're Buddhist. But Buddha taught, study, contemplate, meditate. And all the people, you guys in the mountains, you, you don't have any schools. You don't, you're not educated. We're here to help your children to keep your language, your culture, and your Buddhist way of life. Yeah, so... What our founder did when he started this school was something really revolutionary in the best in the best sense. Yeah. And uh, I mean, how is teaching in Japan, for example, where you lived for a fair portion of your life, around a decade, different compared to here? I I have not much experience uh, teaching in Nepal except here and what i teach is uh, out of the curriculum i teach leadership critical thinking i i for years taught meditation that rinpoche asked me to uh but it's not in the curriculum um so a lot of what i'm teaching children is how to analyze how to stand your ground how to speak for yourself and uh, kind of put them through their paces for that because uh, kids that come out of grade 10 here, it, it's universally noted that grade 10 is extremely stress, stressful. Mm -hmm. And there's a Tibetan term, it's called, it's a sem chung chung. Sem means mind, and chung, chung means narrow and rigid. They come out of grade 10 like this. And my task is to bring life back into them and bring mental, cognitive, emotional, social life and the sense of responsibility and social service, all of those things. In Japan, I was teaching as an ESL teacher, English as a second language, and um, Japanese students are very like our students in this school in that they're highly motivated, they study really hard, we Canadian teachers would say they study too hard. Ah, it's important to have some balance. Uh -huh. And I, I personally, I think that when kids who get sem chungju, it's because too much stress on study and the stress that comes from that. I tell our kids when they're doing mock-ups for SEE and the finals, I tell them every hour you're studying, get outside for 10 minutes in the sun, and run your bums off till you're dripping in sweat. So it'll it's going to balance you a little bit. You'll run off the stress and you'll get those hormones, especially the serotonin from the sunshine, to make the balance you need so you're healthy. And so you do well on your exams. That's the bait. Yeah. Um, 
I'd say in a lot of ways, Nepali kids and Japanese kids are similar. Canada was a different ball game. Uh, I left the public school system when I was forced to make a choice whether I wanted to teach or do psychiatric social work. And I'm not qualified to do so psychiatric social work, but the children were that troubled. So I decided to quit. And then after I was uh, t about to tender my resignation, the staff of an experimental school, which was a public school, came and asked me, would you come and teach with, at, our, at Sundance? And I said, ah, you guys, I'm close to burnout. Uh, but I was so flattered. And it was a really great school. And it was a public school, but it was experimental. So every single child was on his or her individual progress. Really hard teaching. Really, really hard teaching. I, I told the staff there, I, I can give it two years. And I'd love to come. So... And that was also a completely different ball game from the rest of the public school system. Um, in my school district in Canada, at that time, there were 75 schools. And our little school, Sundance, had kind of a reputation. I said, oh, you hippies. And I'd be at different teacher conferences. And I was an officer for the Greater F Victoria Teachers Association. I was on the executive, and I was a representative for the provincial association. And teachers would come up to me and say, oh, you're from Sundance. I was like, Shh. But one teacher came up to me one time and he said, Shirley. And I said, David. He said, I'll say one thing for your kids from Sundance. I said, what's that? He said, they're not afraid to ask questions. Mm -hmm. They came from us and they went to that junior high school where he was teaching, which was very, very, very strict. And he said, they're not afraid to ask questions. And I thought, yeah, we're succeeding on some level. Huh. Yeah. Well, a stark difference that a lot of uh, people have told me about kids in our country compared to kids in the Western part of the world is that kids here are a lot shyer in terms of asking questions. Yes. Is that assessment true? Yes. Yeah. And I, I, I analyze it anthropologically. Nepal and Japan are, um, what to say, an extrinsic shame culture. The West, it's intrinsic. So it's your own conscience kicking you. From a very early age, children in the West in Canada are tra trained and taught and encouraged to be independent, to do it by themselves. At not looking so much, not looking for approval or disapproval from outside. So uh, it makes discipline problems different in Canada than here. Children here are a lot more compliant, but you don't know what they're thinking. Whereas kids in the West, they'll tell you what they're thinking. So that's, that's yeah, you're right about that. Yeah. And how do you balance uh, the students out if they're too compliant? Because sometimes compliance can also trickle down to boisterousness. It might be extremely difficult to control them. I mean, I've also taught in a few schools. I've seen this uh, until violence, uh, no, not violence in the sense that you're, you're giving this, uh, you're, you're injuring them. But until unless there's this threat that something, yes, until unless uh, students get this feel that there might be a physical uh, ramification to their actions, that they tend to be extremely difficult to manage. Push it right to the limit. Uh -huh, yes. Our kids do. And I, I think one of the reasons they don't push it to the limit here is because they feel so grateful. Most of them, especially the ones that come from the remote villages, when they come to us, it's the first time they, they've had enough to eat. And they see our founder, Tanga Rinpoche, as a hero. He, he was a hero. Uh, I, you know, quite a few years ago, we had some pediatricians from 
Germany and Scandinavia visit us. They were doing, uh, they were working at Tribiven Teaching Hospital. And the leader of the group was a Norwegian doctor, Tony Holvold. And I don't know how she found out about us, but she found out about us and she called me and she said, can I bring my team of pediatricians out to see the school? And I said, sure. And she, so they came out. It was winter time. I met them and spent about three hours. We were everywhere on campus and then off they went. And some of them were going back to their home countries the next day. But the next day, Dr. Holville called me again. She said, some of us are still here. Can we come back? I said, sure. But today I don't have enough time to hang with you. So they came back and I saw them come in. I waved at them. And then a couple of hours later, they were still out there. So I went downstairs and one of them, a big German, tall German guy was playing basketball with the kids. He bounced the ball off and he came over and he said, I bet you came back to see why we, you came downstairs to see why we came back. I said, yeah, I did. He said, well, when we were here the other day, we didn't see any aggression. And I said, oh, so you came today to see if you could see some aggression? And he said, yes. I said, did you see any? He said, no. So that's just our kids. Yeah. The point is not, I I think I didn't mean this well enough. I wanted to ask how difficult is it for teachers outside to manage? Ah, outside our school. Oh. Outside our school or maybe outside our country. I think outside, I can speak about Canada. I can speak about Japan because I have that experience. Canada can be quite difficult. Japan, my experience, it wasn't difficult. In Canada, when I decided to leave, the teaching force was when I had children who were so profoundly disturbed, they needed psychiatric help, and I couldn't give it to them. Yeah, I had one child apprehended out of my classroom in grade one, apprehended into crown custody, taken into the care by the, into care by the state because he was so violent. So violent? He was a grade one. And the children, the rest of the children that year in that class, the year was extremely disturbed for them. Yeah. That burned me out. Uh, I don't want to be a part of a system that operates like that. Yeah. Especially, I mean, when we listen to news about schools in West, especially in the United States of America, uh, we tend to hear news a lot about gun violence, people being shot down in the schools, in colleges. Some of my friends who are pursuing PhDs in some colleges tell me that uh, it is quite difficult for them to commute back to their houses after they've been to universities because they think that something bad might happen. Uh, This is, this trend I think has also been uh, maybe overblown by the media in order to get some traction. But there is some sense that the violence is ever increasing in schools. Um, Is there any way out we can make schools safer in that regard? I could say that in Canada, there's very little violence in schools, and definitely not with guns. Um, But... Canada's laws about guns are strict, much stricter. Mm-hmm. In the, I, I don't know about the U.S. It's a huge, huge problem and heartbreaking. And every time one of our kids goes overseas to take up a scholarship, mm-hmm. it is with my prayers. In the United States is very well endowed. The university system's well endowed. There are many, many opportunities for Nepali kids who are hardworking and and very able, academically able. Uh, but but I think there is a risk. I try to direct my kids to small universities where basically where the faculty and student 
students know most everybody knows everybody. Ours feels like that too. Yours is, was based on geography, yeah? Ours is based, the only thing we have in common here is that we're all Buddhist. And most of the kids are Highland kids. But they come from different, slightly different cultures, slightly different ethnic groups, because their ancient roots are Tibetan. They have kind of Mongolian faces rather than Aryan. But what unites us is Buddhism. Yeah. And Buddhist teachings are... Um, I think geared, if you take the teachings in, you think about them, mm -hmm. and you try to integrate them into your thought and your heart and your action, it makes people calmer and also kinder. Mm -hmm. So violence is not an issue here. I, I know of one case of violence here, which involved a kid with a brick. And I don't remember any of the details, but that remains in my mind, and it's like engraved with acid in my memory because it was so shocking. Yeah. And Japan also is not a violent country. In, uh, I, I taught in one of the escalator schools. It's called Waseda. From Waseda school, they could go, many of the boys, it was a boys' school, could go directly into Waseda University, which is one of the Ivy League schools. Of, so very, very good school, very prestigious. And I never saw any violence in Japan. I was almost there a decade, except one day in the winter, I was walking home to catch the subway, and there was a little, little rounded bridge over a canal. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, there was a telephone box and it was lit because somebody was inside on the phone and there was another guy outside who needed to get on the phone and he was trying to get the guy inside to get out of there so he could get in. And as I was walking along, the one who outside and gave up and in a fit of pique, he was smoking. He threw his cigarette at the glass door and there was a sh like a, a shower of red sparks and I went, oh, because that was really shocking. I think that was the worst violence I saw in Japan. It, very unusual. And I think here, too, violence is unusual. It's a sticky society. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you said a while ago that Buddhism might have played a part. For us, for sure. Mm -hmm. For us, for sure. Uh, and many people comment on that when they come here. A, a good number of our supporters are Buddhists, students of our founder. But there are a lot of other people who are just kind people who want to help kids in Nepal. Mm -hmm. They know that Nepal is, is one of the poorest countries in the world. And they know that lots of kids in this country can't get an education. Mm -hmm. So they're helping just out of the goodness of their hearts. And uh, a lot of our sponsors come and visit. They get kind of... They grew to love their kids over the years. And uh, they come to visit, and they'll take a tour of the school, and then they'll come and see me in my office. And ones that are not even Buddhists, they'll come and talk to me, and they, they'll say, with tears in their eyes, surely your kids are so great. And I would say, well, for starters, they're not my kids. Yeah. And yeah, they're great, but it, all kids are great. What you see in these kids is just that they learn a little bit of what Lord Buddha taught, and they're trying to do it. Mm -hmm. That's all it is. But I, on, I honestly think all kids are great. I've taught three groups of children that are really unusual. These mountain kids, kids who grew up off uh, the Pacific coast of Canada on light stations, mm -hmm. so they and kids who grew up in northern Indian reserves in Canada. So these are all kids who have no access, uh, when I was teaching, had no access to television or radio. The kids on the light stations were getting their education by radio phone, blah, 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 over and out. Then the teacher talked uh, back and forth. The kids up north on the reserves, also very isolated, and our kids. And what they have in common is they all have a 
good degree of calm. They all really notice a lot of things. And they are all really generous little kids. And they're all groups who don't have a lot. Like our little kids, they get two piece, two dried pieces of yak cheese, and that's all they've got. Some relative has come and given them two pieces of yak cheese, and they'll run up to you and try to give you one of them. And the kids from the night stations and the northern reserves were like that too. And I think all kids have magic. But sometimes modern society covers that magic over with stuff that kids don't need, like aggression, neurosis, things it, in we in modern society affect children with. But if children are able to grow up in a kind of an untouched environment, they're pretty pure little people. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, one of the other things that is not really helping the cause of a lot of students is this addiction to cell phones, laptops, technology, things like that. Uh, it's become quite an indispensable part of everybody's lives that you can't do without it. But you see kids who are three or four years old who don't really know how to talk all that fluently. They can work an iPhone no. or iPad. Yes, and sometimes that's taken as a symbol of pride in our, in our society. That, look, there, there's a little toddler of mine who can't walk, but he knows how to uh, take a photograph or how to um, click one. And if you go to a few hospitals in our country, like I have, especially child-centered hospitals, they tell me that some of their necks have had a bit of problem by years glaring down on the phone too much. Uh, we also have a lot of students who have problems being addicted to online games and things like that. So is that another of the challenges that you see? As Not here. Our children aren't allowed to have any gadgets. When they finish grade 10, if they're um, giving service, we give them a chance. We say, you've been here and you've had a good home, good food, medical care, dental, everything, and an education, and you learn what Buddha taught. Rinpoche gave you all this. Do you want to help Rinpoche with his three aims? And most of them say yes, they do. Um, once they reach that stage, we call them seniors, and they are then allowed to have gadgets, like smartphones. But we tell them at school, you can't use the smartphones in front of the little kids. Because you'll set up desire on their part. They'll be curious and they'll want to be doing the same. Yeah. And the reason we have this in place is because those gadgets create isolation. And we're here to create community, to continue community. Yeah. And our, our success, she says proudly, is we've got kids from Dolpo, Homla, Jumla, Solu, Sindhu Palcho, all the mountain districts, quite different places. But we, we are Triangu family. Sometimes we call ourselves SMD family, and that is, that is who we are. Yeah, same as you in your school with the community because people know each other. It's the common purpose, which is the purpose is larger than just self. Yeah. And I would say that in your education, my guess is your teachers stressed curiosity, commitment, involvement in society, um, adding rather than taking. My guess is that was stressed a lot in your education. That's why you do what you do. <laughs> well, did I hit the <laughs> did I hit the target? Well, I, for one, think that children are better left alone. First, <laughs> <laughs> uh, the song by Pink Floyd, uh, "A Teacher's Liver." <laughs> I think that hits home. 
it was a sort of an anthem when I was in grade 11 and 12. Um, but yeah, I, I think that I had a few teachers who taught me things without actually trying. Now this might by by example. Yes, yeah. By just the way they were. Ah, uh, for right. instance, um, there's a great town in India, Darjeeling, and when I was a kid, uh, it was the fashion around Kathmandu that you had teachers from Darjeeling come over. Very, very good Nepali. Yes, very good yeah. Nepalese could talk English fluently and very gifted musically as well. So when there were programs such as Children's Day or Teachers' Day or Parents' Day and and all of the teachers would come around, have a ball, some would play guitar, some would play the drums, some would play other instruments. And uh, and I thought oh, it'd be decent to be musical as well. I mean, there was no compulsory music, but it, it, it gave me the sense that it'd be nice to form a musical community that way. Uh, some, of them, some of them even encouraged us to participate in tree plantation around in Nagarkut and uh, places like that. So we did go there. But uh, when we went there about four or five years later, we didn't really have it because uh, trees, well, building up a great family of trees is not simply about plantation, but taking care of it as well. So it was not followed up properly, to my dismay, uh, because when we were kids, we had a lot of excitement to go. We were in Ireland. Ah, yes, yes. We were. So I think that they didn't try to force anything it just let the magic happen as they call it so in that sense they did um and i think that we were fortunate in that we didn't we didn't have a lot of technology around that so it gave us a lot of time to open up with other people we had nowhere to go to but friends now you could reserve back to yourself the relationship was more important yes it was gadgets were not uh -huh. Uh -huh. so I, I think that i was helped by a few teachers but uh, yeah, I have good memories of them, but some of them, uh, some some of the things that I experienced as a student was a bit of favoritism that some teachers had. They'd be inclined more towards uh, people who could perform better in the examinations. So they had a soft corner for those students, and for ones like me who were more interested in playing cricket and. <laughs> <laughs> A very sporty. You didn't have any cricket while at teachers? Uh, yeah, we, we did, we did. But uh, for us, we didn't quite do the homework as regularly, or maybe we weren't as subservient as some other students were. They tended to look down upon us, which is why I asked you if it was true in the West that you could ask a few questions. You could be a tad rebellious. Yeah, but if you're a rebel around here, you, the society tends to look down. Uh, in, in Japan, there's a saying that the ha the nail that sticks up gets hammered down, uh -huh. and I think it that's true in this. And that's what what I'm talking about: extrinsic conscience, extrinsic extrinsic shame society. Mm -hmm. The pressure is coming from outside. In the West, it's more inside, and so kids can pretty much fend for themselves and ask questions and. To look at it, to give you an example from a different angle, our kids that go overseas to, that get scholarships, they have to compete. Mm -hmm. They're competing with the best to get the best. And a very common experience for our kids is when they get into a classroom, mm -hmm. uh, they can't get into the discussion because it, it's like a shark feeding frenzy. Mm -hmm. And our kids are too polite, waiting for somebody to, to go like this, like, okay, you talk. But it's not like that in the West. It's you got to jump in. And our kids have a really hard time with that. All of them do. Of all our kids, there's only one who went overseas who uh, they always, the teachers say, this one needs to participate more in class, da-da-da-da-da-da. One did not. She did not get that, but she, she's Sherpa. <laughs> and the Sherpa women are pretty strong. Yes. Um, another thing that I was really curious about is whether you're a practicing Buddhist as well, because maybe it might be helpful for the Buddhism to trickle down onto other teachers and students as well. I am a Buddhist, and uh, Rinpoche did ask me to teach the children meditation, and I did for years. I, a couple of years, first of all, I looked for a monk or nun who could do it instead of me. Because I, I'm not even Nepali, 
I'm not in robes. Um, and I, everybody was, they couldn't, they were too busy, or the nuns are far away in Sitapaila, 40 minutes in no traffic. And finally I thought, oh, I guess I have to. But it actually it was great joy. Um, but with our teachers, and a lot of our teachers aren't Buddhists. It's not, it's not my business to make them Buddhist at all. But they do need to know why Rinpoche started the school. And they do need to know this isn't an ordinary school. And the day when that dawned on me, I, this is many years ago, I called in two young men, new hires, day teachers, to my office. And they were, they were math teachers, young men, highly educated. And the, it's the math teachers that are the hot shots. I don't know if you guys know this. Yes, yes. This, I, I see know. this big time. And they're always guys, and they're always young. So they came, came into my office, and I think they were wondering, uh, what did she call us in here for? I this weird, <laughs> this weird Canadian woman. And uh, so I just started to talk to them about Rinpoche uh, and told them he escaped from Tibet when Tibet fell to the communists, and he survived, and he spent nine years in Sikkim as the abbot of a monastery, then he came here. And when he first came to this country, he was living up in Namo Buddha in a cow shed. And these guys were kind of really astonished. And I then explained why Rinpoche started the school. Mm. Uh, when I started to volunteer for Rinpoche, I went to him and said, why did you start SMD? And I had to know, because it's important to know what motivation is. And that's when he told me about his three aims. And so I told these young men, this is why Rinpoche started this school. And in Tibet, he had a huge monastery. He had retreat centers, and he had publishing. And here he is in Nepal. He lost his country, he lost everything. And he spent his whole life in exile, giving education and health care to the people of Nepal. All the people in his institutions are from Nepal except the old monks who escaped with them. And these two young guys went, is this school free? And I said, yeah, all the kids go to this school for free because there are no schools in the mountains. And their attitude uh, was really different from that point afterwards. Mm -hmm. When they understood why Trangu Rinpoche started the school, it's like somebody lit a butter lamp in their hearts completely, I mean, they were really good teachers before. That's why we hired them. But now, after that, they were teachers who taught with heart. And then I think the teachers that affected you when you were young, they're probably teachers who were engaging with their heart. Whatever they were teaching by example, mm -hmm. it's because they were living something good that you kids could see, that you were kids thinking, well, I want to go like that too. These two teachers, um, yeah, it's not my job to make our teachers be Buddhist. Not everybody in this country is Buddhist. I think about 80% are not, yeah? But they need to know why our Lama started the school. Yeah, it helps them in their teaching. Because when your heart is engaged, you're a better teacher. And uh, one of the perceptions it's quite difficult to teach with your heart because in our country, teachers are sort of looked down upon. Uh, it's been said that ah, he can't do, he's not good at anything. Maybe so he teaches, teach, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, I've heard that so many times. But my rebuttal to that, and it is to everybody watching this podcast, think back to your own education and think back to teachers who scarred you one way or another, and then think back to the teachers who inspired you. Those are real teachers. And I firmly subscribe to the notion that anybody can be a real teacher. So our, our support staff here, uh, they've been involved in teaching, not curriculum teaching, but skills that they can do, like one of our cooks, he has a black belt in karate. 
he teaches karate to our kids. His own sensei came here from the dojo, looked at us, talked to us, and gave permission to our cook. His name's Buddha. He's got the coolest name in the school, in my opinion. Um, so Buddha teaches karate. Uh, one of our um, amalas, one of our, our amala means mother in Tibet. La is honorific. One of our amalas uh, was teaching knitting, a skill I wish I had learned in my lifetime. Then I could knit nice sweaters like this, but I can't, never learned. Uh, uh, different different support staff teach different skills according to what their interests or passions are. Yeah. I think everybody can teach something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, now that you've taught so much, maybe you're thinking of retirement sometime in between. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. Yeah. One of these days, but I'm 77 now. I think, well, what am I, how am I going to go? I can't, uh, I'm needed still. I would, uh, I, there need to be people who can step into my shoes. And the best people to step into my shoes are not Canadian or American or German or whatever. The best will be Nepali. And the best will be Nepali who've come up through our school. And I, I, in our school, we have some people in uh, junior admin now. I see real talent, real ability. Um, a number of them. I, I actually was training a young man to learn to do what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he writes as, as well as I can. English is my first language. It's his fourth. When I complimented him this week, <laughs> he said, well, I use spell check. And I said, well, it's just as well because people are judging. Yeah. So, but we've got a number. They're coming up into their early 30s. And when they get a little bit older, they'll be able to do it. Right now, the handicap would be, uh, unfortunately, young people are not respected for their... No, let me come at it from a different direction. It goes like this for young people. You're young, what do you know? Nepal, that happens to young people too much. Rather than looking at what is their talent and what they're offering. Yeah. And uh, to do what I do, I think it would be helpful for somebody to be mid-30s, early 40s at least. Yeah. It's harder to pull off when you're younger. But our own kids have four languages. They have their village language, they have Tibetan, they have Nepali, they have English. And usually by the time they finish grade 10, they also have Hindi because of Bollywood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, there was a book about Japan that was written and it became an international bestseller. I think the title was Ikigai. And uh, it, it, so, it was about this island called Okinawa which had the greatest number of centenarians in all of Japan. And it was said in the book that Okinawans have something that's known as ikigai. It gives them a sense of waking up in the morning to do something. Of purpose. Of purpose. And they also ascribe to this idea that one shouldn't retire. If you're doing what you love, what is the point of... It's not work. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I think that you also have this in an ikigai of some ways helping. And I think you hit the target, yeah. What I have often said is I work for the best kids in the world. Mm -hmm. Nepali kids rock, yeah. And uh, Trangu Rinpoche was the best boss you could have ever had, yeah. I was so lucky to meet him in this lifetime. And, and uh, if the government has not recognized what you've done, uh, I'd like to say that the two of us who are running the podcast, do you have a sense of appreciation that you've come all the way from Canada, traversing all the way to Japan, to our country, to help these wonderful kids? It's been wonderful talking to you, and thank you so much for all of the wonderful work. You guys are most welcome, and please continue your good work. Yeah? Sure. We'll try to. People like you give me hope for Nepal. The young people give me hope. Yeah.
Wonderful words. It's the truth. Yeah. 